Fantastic Four casting rumors continue to run rampant. Wonder Woman 3 might still be in the works, and Barbie breaks a billion. That news and more awaits you after this. Welcome to Multiverse News, your source for information about all your favorite fictional universes. My name is Matthew Carroll, and on our panel today we have Haley Hobbs. What's going on, Haley? Not much, just chilling here in the multiverse, ready to deliver some hot news. Ooh, nice. And Jay Sisson, what's happening, Jay? I don't know how much hot news I'll be delivering, but, you know, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> you got all the cold stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my takes are semi-spicy. Not, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call them hot. Mild, mild takes. Yeah. Uh, and up next, Jay Scotty St. Clair. How's it going, Jay Scotty? Hey, hey, doing peachy. A little surprised that James Gunn didn't drop some bombs on us right before recording. It seems like he has a habit of doing that every two weeks, but not this <laughs> week. Still got some fun stuff to talk about, though. Come on, James. You, you fallen off? Come on. You got to stick with us. He posted a cute <laughs> picture of his dog recently. Ooh. Well, there I'll we take go. It. <laughs> and we reported it. I'm sorry. Is this, uh, is this the dog podcast? No, it's not. It should be. Get out of here, Jay. <laughs> dog hater. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to get to our first story. Uh, we've discussed Fantastic Four casting rumors at length in the past, but even if not 100% confirmed, the latest batch seems to be the most credible and likely so far, with Vanessa Kirby reportedly cast as the MCU's Sue Storm. And that's the most secure one we know. Uh, additionally, Matt Smith has emerged as an apparent frontrunner uh, for Reed Richards. And Stranger Things' Joseph Quinn, you would know him as Eddie Munson, uh, is being eyed for Johnny Storm. The Bears' Ebon Moss Bakrak has also been offered a role, as well as Jack Quaid joining the film, although not as one of the four. Lastly, it's rumored that Antonio Banderas has been offered the role to voice Galactus, who will evidently feature prominently in the film. Do these rumors and reports warrant enough credibility to cast away our doubts? Has the first member of Marvel's first family finally been found? There's so many F's in that sentence. <laughs> you know, I was doing the alliteration just for you. I dig it, I dig it Jay yeah. Scotty. Yeah. So with these casting rumors, it's a little bit of a mixed bag for me. On the one hand, I am over the moon excited for Vanessa Kirby. The fact that it sounds like it's all but solidified bodes really well for me. And I find myself, you know, really wishing to have this officially confirmed and, and seeing this pan out. On the other side of things, the rest of these names, outside of Jack Quaid, like that's the only one I really associate with like a lot of positivity for me personally and he's not playing mm. one of the four so it'll be interesting to see who he does play but I think you know his talent agent uh, is is doing a really good job for him because he's connected to all these like various you know geeky properties and he's usually does a really good job in them I've been watching my adventures with Superman on Max and Adult Swim and he's been doing a stand-up job there these other names though yeah um just not really moving the needle for me. Matt Smith, uh, I, I know he's a wonderful performer, but everything that I've seen him in hasn't hasn't really done it. I know he was in Morbius. I hear good things about him in House of Cards. I know he's a lot of people's favorite doctor, but House of the Dragon, House of Cards is the House of oh, Cards yeah. is the different thing. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah. House, yeah we House don't talk about we don't, cards. we don't talk about that guy. He's uh, he's <laughs> he's <laughs> yeah, he's been going through uh, his own stuff. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, the uh, the other people uh, was it uh, Joseph Quinn? Yeah, I, I'm not exposed to him. I haven't watched the later seasons of Stranger Things. But I, you know, all this being said, I'm willing to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. And when it comes to newcomers, I think that's a great way to cast. So I will kind of reserve judgment until these castings are official and I get a chance to see these people at least in some costumes and in in the roles. Uh, but then, you know, the final piece here, Antonio Banderas as Galactus. I think it's really interesting to learn that Galactus is going to play such a prominent role. Um, he's always been associated with the Fantastic Four and the way DMCU has been going lately. I think it makes a lot of sense. But I was, you know, expecting Dr. Doom to be the big bad here. And, and maybe there's still room for Dr. Doom to appear alongside Galactus. But with Antonio Banderas, obviously a wonderful performer. He's got that gravitas. He's got a great voice. I immediately think of Puss in Boots. But... Uh, you know, I'm I'm all for. <laughs> I immediately all, think of Puss in Boots. Yeah, I'm just hearing like I I won't. Mask of Zorro, be damned. 
I shouldn't do the accent. Well, I was thinking of like a vocal performance. I'm like trying to separate Antonio Banderas and just hear his voice and like Puss in Boots is the first thing that comes to mind. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm also I'm all for diversity and, and representation, but I, I guess when I was thinking of Galactus, and again, I'm trying you know weigh my expectations versus what's actually delivered and, and reserve judgment there. But I was just expecting someone with a little bit more of a deep gravel, like. Um, it was on the Stranded Panda chat, but somebody put a post out there asking for suggestions, and I came up with Dennis Haysbert, the Allstate guy, and I, I can't kind of mm. can't let that go. Like I, that's that's kind of <laughs> what I want, something in that neighborhood. So, um, like I said at the beginning, a little bit of a mixed bag, but woohoo for Vanessa Kirby, love it. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, extra kind of tag-ons to this to these rumors too, and <clears throat> I'll lead by saying that if you're annoyed at hearing us talk about Fantastic Four casting rumors, like I am also equally annoyed that I'm talking about <laughs> Fantastic Four <laughs> casting rumors because it just seems like this is the rumor mill that never ends. But there's a lot of other things that go along with this because we and a lot of people talked about the initial casting from a month ago that included Adam Driver and Margot Robbie. Evidently, that was true. Uh, but Margot Robbie wanted a lot more money than Marvel was willing to give up. And um, I'm with you, Jay Scotty. I think Vanessa Kirby is a great choice for the role. She's done action. She's done drama. Like she's been in all of these different roles over the years that really proves how just wide range uh, of a talent that she really is. But apparently Adam Driver has turned down this role multiple times, has been the reports that Marvel keeps coming back to him with more money, more offers to try to get, they want him really bad in this role mm. and names like Matt Smith and others have kind of emerged as kind of like the plan B in this whole thing if the Adam Driver thing falls through so that's something to keep an eye on the Joseph Quinn thing yeah I'm, I'm with you it that's surprising to me I really loved him in Stranger Things he was excellent in every scene that he was in if you watch Stranger Things you probably walked away from last season thinking that his character was one of the greatest parts of that whole season. But I just don't know if I feel him in this role particularly. Uh, and uh, it just doesn't really fit kind of like what we've seen him do on screen. It doesn't mean he can't adapt and change, but that was definitely an eyebrow raiser. And uh, past that, like there's a lot of big names here that we don't know where to put them. Like Jack Quaid. I mean, who knows what where he's going to go. He's a big talent Like to get him in this role uh, and then kind of have it be undisclosed is interesting. And then, um, you know, even Moss uh, Bar... Bacharach from uh, The Bear, like some people are speculating that he could be the Silver Surfer or some kind of big character like that. But again, big name, but not necessarily attached to any big role. So it'll be really interesting to see how that pans out going forward. But man, the uh, just make it stop. You know, let's get, <laughs> make it stop. I'm tired, tired of talking about Fantastic Four. Yeah, it's like, and I know that they're going to just come out and announce people that we haven't even talked about that we're going to have to be like, well, uh, you know, Matt Smith turned it down. We're going to have to go back and retract all this at some point. So whatever. It's, it's always interesting <laughs> to me how so many of these, uh, like especially with Fantastic Four and there being the four of them and it being so important that they have um, the chemistry like there was an initial the four that were being rumored and the next four are a completely different four being rumored and then different <laughs> because it's, yeah. and, and I wonder if that's a legitimate like thing or if we're just hearing bits and pieces from the casting process, because a lot of times they read for, you know, how are these actors going to work together? Apparently like, um, I was, we may have talked, we may have talked about this on the show. Apparently like star Lord, um, you know, um, Chris, Pratt had read for Star Lord and they didn't like what he was doing. They were like, no, he doesn't work. He doesn't work. Then they put him on stage with Dave Batista and they read together and it was like magic, like the two of them mm. playing off each other. It's things like that where you just never know, like two people work together, then the same person comes in with someone else. It just doesn't work. And those chemistry reads are, I feel like, really important for this particular casting. Um, mm. Fantastic Four, finding four people that all fit together and all the dynamics between the four of them cross-pollinating the right way. It's, it seems really tough. Yeah, the reports are too is that Vanessa Kirby and Sue Storm is supposed to be the main character of this movie, that the movie is going Ooh. to run through Sue Storm. And so the idea Good. is that they're going to build the movie around her, not necessarily that they're going to cast pieces to try to 
you know, share an equal amount of the spotlight or whatever, but that this is a very Sue Storm centered story and that the cast is supposed to be around this strong lead. So that's something to keep in mind too. I love Matt Smith for Reed Richards and I love him with Vanessa Kirby and they've acted together in The Crown before when they were brother and sister-in-law. So they might have the chemistry that Matt's talking about. And I think that Matt Smith can play that like kind of put upon genius that Reed Richards is in the comics Mm. and that he does need to be in this film probably. Um, I really don't like Adam Driver for that role at all. Um, If Marvel is really going at him that hard, I kind of hope they're going at him for a different role because I don't think he fits the Reed Richards cut. Um, The other actors I don't know a lot about other than um, Yvonne, what's his face? And what's his name? And, uh, I, I, I love Antonio Banderas, and I think he would have like a very cool, exotic take on Galactus, who is an alien, so we don't know what he sounds like. He doesn't have to have some, you know, American-accented, like, deep voiceover voice, uh, and he doesn't go anywhere without his Herald, the Silver Surfer, so maybe that's Jack Quaid instead of the other guy. I don't know, Ooh. but I love Vanessa Kirby. Yeah. I can't wait to see her. Yeah, I I agree with you, Haley. I think I lean more towards Jack Quaid being Silver Surfer. And when I think of Ebon Moss Bachrock, like, I'm immediately going towards Ben Grimm the Thing. Like, I don't know why they would hold that back if he was being considered for Hmm. it. But considering this list of names, I think he's one of the lesser known ones. So if if this character is going to be, you know, heavily under, like, CGI or even using some prosthetics, because I'll be on record, like, those Fantastic Four films from the aughts, I didn't mind Michael Chiklis, you know, the, the prosthetics they mm-hmm. use on him. I thought they actually worked. So if they wanted to take that approach, approach again, like, I'd be down for it. And I think a little bit of a lesser known, like, a rising star like Ebon Moss Bachrach and the fact that, you know, Ben Grimm is traditionally Jewish in the comics. I, I think it kind of lends right. itself to that casting there. All right. Well, I'm sure we will hopefully not talk about this again, <laughs> this but I'm sure we this will. This is round two of eight of Fantastic yeah. Four rumor <laughs> casting. Everybody buckle in. <laughs> hopefully soon we'll get actual announcements. What's our, what's the next chance to announce something like this? Cause I, I, I don't even think like you can a, until the writers and actor strike is hammered out. I, oh. I don't, I don't think you can, uh, I, I'm going to have to look at, look at that, but I don't think you can officially do a lot of that stuff until, hmm. until that, comes out like uh, you can have rumors like what we're doing right now but i don't know if necessarily you can sign these contracts officially and stuff until that actually becomes you know taken care of or has run its course interesting wrinkle all right this is gonna last forever got it (laughs) um next we'll we'll talk about that next time in an interview with comicbook.com gal gadot spoke hopefully on her future as Wonder Woman, saying, I love portraying Wonder Woman. It's so close and dear to my heart. From what I heard from James Gunn and Peter Safran, uh, we're going to develop a Wonder Woman 3 together. In the midst of ongoing shakeups at Warner Brothers slash DC, as James Gunn looks to right the ship with his new DCU, do we feel Gal is lassoing us in with any truth or merit to her claims? <laughs> I'm very much of two minds on this piece of news. I love Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman. She embodies the things that Diana is, and she looks amazing. I mean, she's just a home run. And that first Wonder Woman movie was just one of my favorite superhero movies ever. It just did something for women that a lot of other movies obviously haven't. But uh, James Gunn took the helm and was very clear that all these actors that were in the Snyderverse, I guess we'll call it, aren't coming back. So now it's being flipped on its head and I'm it's making me question his credibility a little bit. And is he already kind of bending to fan backlash? Um, I mean, I, I love it. I just, it concerns me. Wonder Woman 1984 was so bad. <laughs> um, and I really don't want to see her yeah. wasted like that again. And so... I don't think they would do that. I don't think that kind of story would happen with Gunn at the helm, but it's just very odd that he's kind of on this seesaw right now of, well, I'm getting rid of him, but maybe we'll keep Gal. Yeah, I do wonder what he means, or I guess what she means, because she gave the quote, by saying that we are going to work on it together. Uh, I think 
what it's probably not is it's probably not a true Wonder Woman 3 that continues the story that was started in the Snyderverse. Uh, I would be extremely surprised if that were the case because evidently Patty Jenkins and Gal Gadot both had a script that they liked and that was canceled uh, when the DCU was rebooted uh, under Gunn and Safran. So I don't think it's that. I think when she says we're developing it together, that could mean a lot of different things. There's probably like three possibilities here. Uh, one possibility is that she is not starring in a Wonder Woman film, but she is attached to it as like a producer or a director, or like someone who she can put her name on it and somehow be involved in the production of it. Um, another possibility is that she is just going to play the rebooted Wonder Woman in this universe and we'll just ignore the things that we don't want to carry over and we'll accept the things that we just need to have carried over to this character and we'll just kind of like soft reboot the character with her. Um, and then the third option is that she will be involved in the, a movie and she'll play some sort of a role, but that role will not be the wonder woman going forward. Like she'll be some kind of chief or something that helps hand down powers and training to the new Diana and this new universe or, or whatever. Mm. I think it could really be any of those things. Her, her wording was not, Hey, I'm coming out and I'm going to be wonder woman again. It was just that we're developing a wonder woman in this new DCU. So I think that vagueness kind of lends itself to be a lot of different possibilities here, you know, except calling it wonder Woman three right. feels like they're saying it's going to be a continuation of one and two. And this will be the third. For sure. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I do think that if they like start off this universe, let's say they do this uh, Superman. What's it called? Superman Legacy. Legacy. Thank you. They're they're talking about all these meta humans already exist. If they do Superman Legacy and they're going up against a big foe, and he's a young Superman upstart fighting his way through whatever battle, and then they have almost the exact same entrance that she had in a uh, with Doomsday, and that music kicks off, and she shows up, and she's just this Wonder Woman as well, and is an alternate universe version. I don't think anyone would complain. Like that music kicking in and Gal Gadot showing up, everybody'd be like, "All right, yeah, we're in. She's here. It's fine." <laughs> um, I, I would, I would not. And, and and the thing is, James Gunn, Haley, you said he had been real clear. He's kind of been unclear. Like he said, the one thing he did say was like, "Henry Cavill is not Superman," but like kind of everyone else, he's been sort of like, "Maybe uh, Ezra Miller, yeah, he's our Flash, and this guy over here, maybe not, and this one over there." Like he said, he's rebooting the universe. But he's been really unclear about what that means, whether it means that it'll be like an internal reboot, like a Flashpoint type thing, or like, which I guess is kind of what they were trying for initially anyway, um, with the Flash film. But that's all before he came around. So, like, I don't know. I have no idea what he's planning. But it does seem that, especially with the chain, one of the few changes we know he was responsible for in the Flash, like, it seems like he's willing to bring in old people and new people and just have them be a part of whatever universes he's creating. So I don't know. I think he's, I think he's just taken whatever he thinks is best from the different things. I don't think it's smart though. I think it's better if they start fresh and just do something new. That's what I was going to say. Like him being Mm -hmm. unclear is not really a good direction for this to go when this universe has struggled so much already. And I think that's like my biggest problem is that it, 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 you got to make a decision and I'm sure everybody would be happy for Gal to come back as Wonder Woman because she is just literally the embodiment of that character. But I I think he wants to make such a impact on DC and, and change things and waffling like this. Because I think that didn't she, she and some of them were like going to sue Warner Brothers for contract issues, I, whatever. I, I just, it's like, it's going to be time to pick a lane soon. <laughs> So yeah, with this Wonder Woman 3 possibility, I agree with a lot of what's been said. I do think James Gunn was very clear out of the gate that this was supposed to be a clean reset, but I think as time has gone on, it's become less and less clear. And, you know, you mentioned the possibility of like Gal Gadot returning as like an alternate version of Diana and how like people would not complain if that happened. And I certainly would not complain if that happened either. But thinking about this new landscape, I think it just does think make things really murky. Like... You've got Matt Reeves and Robert Pattinson off doing their own thing, even Joaquin Phoenix and his version of the Joker out there. But I think there's room in this DCU, this DCU for Elseworlds. But 
especially considering that he got rid of Henry Cavill. I think when you look at the Trinity, that being Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, that's where you have to commit to the recasting. Like you can have, you know, he's got John Cena as Peacemaker, Viola Davis as Amanda Waller. I think there's room where there could be a seamless transition and have those actors come back and it wouldn't really be, be a big deal. But if you're taking Henry Cavill out of the picture, like, don't get me wrong. I love Gal and I want the best for her. And I, I really love her as Wonder Woman and would like to see her return to the role, maybe somewhere down the line. But I really think they have to take like a long period of time away from it and really establish this DCU. Um, otherwise, what's kind of the point? What was the point of cutting Henry Cavill out? I know she mm-hmm. doesn't look at either, but Gal Gadot is uh, 38 years old. So I think okay. whenever you're talking about recasting Henry Cavill, that was a lot of the conversation was, well, he's a little bit too old. We're wanting this universe to go on for a decade plus, And we want all these characters to share across pop- properties and everything like has been done in Marvel. And to do that, I think you do need to look a little bit younger in terms of who you're casting for thinking about the longevity of the whole thing, especially with Superman legacy, not coming out for another two years anyway. And that mm-hmm. being the start of the universe. I mean, when are we even going to see Wonder Woman on screen? It's probably going to be several years down the road. So I think that's something to consider in this whole thing as well, is uh, what are you what are you looking for in this big universe going forward in terms of the longevity of these core pieces, these core heroes in your, in your connected space? For sure. And I did Wikipedia Gal Gadot, too, by the way. So I, <laughs> I was like, what? She uh, doesn't look 38. Yeah, I was, I, like, there's, sold her soul. I was like, there's no way... Uh, that I'm going to be able to guess uh, how old Gal Gadot is. So. That's all the problem. Like, uh, <laughs> keeps her young. No kidding. <laughs> all right. Up next, crazy, crazy. It was another promising weekend at the box office as Barbie officially broke $1 billion worldwide. Woo-hoo. Despite passing this benchmark, there are currently no plans or deals in place for a sequel with Greta Gerwig, Margot Robbie, or Ryan Gosling. Elsewhere, Oppenheimer continued to hold strong, crossing the $550 million mark, and newcomers The Meg 2 and TMNT Mutant Mayhem enjoyed respectable debut outings. The Haunted Mansion reboot, conversely, fell another 63% in its second weekend after an already hauntingly slow start. What do we think of these box office trends and the future of these franchises? I mean, what an amazing success story this year at the box office has been. If you look at last year's numbers from January to August compared to this year's numbers from January to August, this box office is up, I think, like 22 or 23 percent from last year. So it seems like people are going back to the movies, but they're only going for very specific things. So we're seeing some event films like Mario and Barbie and Oppenheimer have these huge box office weekends. And then you're seeing other films like Haunted Mansion not really be received as an event film and pay the price at the box office. Uh, Mm. The Flash is another example, right, of these movies that people are probably going to see eventually, but they're just not necessarily interested in taking the whole family and going to the theater to see these things. But Barbie crossing a billion dollars, I think if you would have said this a few months ago, before all of the marketing started, you would have been surprised by that statement. I don't think anybody expected that this movie would take off and become what it became, which is really a cultural piece of this year, 2023. And, um, just the marketing, the Barbenheimer thing, the just how good the movie is in and of itself as a product have all catapulted it to this crazy level. And at this point, we're talking about it might end up being the biggest movie of the year. It might cross Mario. I think Mario is sitting at somewhere around 1.5 billion or something like that. So Barbie continues to have a strong month. It doesn't really seem like there's anything in front of it for the rest of August. You've got a couple smaller films like the Gran Turismo movie coming out at the end of the month. But Other than that, I mean, we may legitimately be talking about Barbie as the number one movie at the box office for the rest of August, which would be really crazy when you think about it. But that's a legitimate possibility uh, that next weekend when we talk about what movie made the most, uh, we got Blue Beetle coming out is the only hurdle that it would have to jump. But we may be talking about Barbie again in the number one spot. So um, it's just kind of showing us the the Barbillions are real. I mean, this uh, this movie (laughs) is getting a sequel. Like, I, I know that no Nobody signed for it, and I get it. Uh, but this movie's getting a sequel. If you're Warner Brothers, you're like, 
uh, you're you're going to give them whatever they want to make a sequel again. I mean, this uh, mm-hmm. this movie, you need more of it if you're if you're uh, Warner Brothers. I saw a quote from Greta Gerwig on Variety today that she's ready to head back to Barbie Land and she would do a sequel. Me, I'm kind of like I don't know if I want that because Barbie feels like lightning in a bottle and it's so special and so unique and I don't know that they can recreate that again so she's on board at least yeah the last couple weekends of august are typically kind of the last gasps in terms of like summer blockbusters for these studios so the fact that our entire top four including two newcomers like have grossed more than 20 million dollars just speaks to what you were talking about jay just the health of the box office right now which is really you know encouraging especially when we have you know two ongoing strikes happening right now it's kind of unprecedented and kind of wild but yeah barbie is obviously the big story here crossing that billion dollar threshold we all knew it was going to happen but i don't think anybody really knew it was going to happen not that long ago it just really has taken the world by storm and It is kind of interesting talking about Barbie right off the heels of Wonder Woman because thinking about the fact that we don't have a sequel locked down, like I know the strikes are a part of that, but it does remind me of the conversation surrounding Wonder Woman. Like it took a long time for Patty Jenkins to be uh, attached to that Wonder Woman sequel, Wonder Woman 84, which, you know, despite the lackluster uh, reception, she deserved that opportunity. And uh, backpedaling a little bit to that Wonder Woman 3 story, I would hope that they would allow Patty Jenkins to be included in some capacity if it were to go forward. Uh, but I, I guess thinking about the Barbie cast and whatnot, it's a little unrelated, but uh, it didn't make our news docket in any way, shape or form. But I saw a little tidbit that Ryan Gosling apparently ordered like a Barbie flash mob for Greta Gerwig's 40th birthday. So just <laughs> seeing the chemistry that this, this, these creators have off off the set and whatnot just is really bodes well for me and, and just increases my enjoyment of the Barbenheimer cultural phenomenon and, and does make me excited to see some future for this franchise. You know, just guy, you, you made me think about something like compare connecting these really great numbers in the box office with the strikes is interesting. I, I in a previous week had discussed the idea that like, I'm scared that this, a lot of this consternation and, uh, activity with the striking and with the refusal to pay the actors what they're worth and everything is part of the struggle of this shrinking pie. It's like people aren't going to the box office as much. They're not going to the theaters as often. Like numbers have been down for successive year after year after year. And now everyone's like, and nobody's like, nobody's getting paid as well. And everyone's fighting over the shrinking pie. But it's like kind of ironic if that's the case that like suddenly this pie is expanding and it's getting back to where it was and like we're seeing these billion dollar movies again and they're all on strike it's like can we can we can we talk about it again like can can you guys like maybe loosen your grip on the money a little bit and pay people what they're worth and like sure. <laughs> like you know you know may, may, maybe there's hope maybe you don't have to be so uh tight with everything i don't know yeah i think it's totally fair all right, up next we got our Spotify poll for this week. Uh, Jay, what, 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 what do we even ask? I have no memory. <laughs> well, like I said, we were. I've been telling you guys I'm a little hungover from my party on uh, Sunday and uh, still don't remember that we got together to do this show. Like, how long has it been since we did this show? Like, two years? <laughs> so when, I, when I sat down to do this, I was like, I don't know what's going on today. <laughs> well, we talked a lot about Loki last week, and one of the conversations mm. that we had was Loki, uh, talking about how Loki just kind of has a lot of heavy lifting to do in the MCU. It seems like the MCU is at kind of a low point. And so we asked the question, did the Loki trailer restore your Marvel excitement? And we gave the viewers three questions options. We said yes, no, but we also left an option for, well, mine just never left. And um, yes was the lead with 55% of the vote. So people are feeling a renewed hope in Marvel after watching this Loki trailer. Uh, Mm. 40% of people said that theirs never left, that they uh, never wavered. And uh, only 4% of people said no. They're just like, nope, I'm done. I'm out. (laughs) Interesting. I actually love those numbers because... In the stranded pandaverse, uh, we we you know we started this network in the Marvel podcast, so it's interesting to see there's four people in our audience that are like, 
Ah, Marvel. Like, it's, 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 <laughs> I love it. I love it. They just hate, um, they hate listening to this stuff. They're just like, look, yeah. Marvel. <laughs> well, it's Skip like we talk- 30 seconds. <laughs> On this show, we talk about so much else that it's interesting to see that, like, you know, there's, there, 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 we've got a, you know, a contingent, hopefully a growing contingent that's like, you know, not, that's not why they're here. They're here for the, all the other news. I love that. So I see you 4%. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not mad at you at all. But uh, I, I think, yeah. The the fact that yes is fifty five percent is like that's a lot of people in the, at least in our audience that like felt discouraged and then Loki yeah. picked them back up. Yeah, they had the option yeah. to say that there's never left and they said yeah. yes. That's also so. a big chunk. Yeah. Yeah. To, yeah. to that for sure. To that point, I never fell off completely, but I did find myself a little discouraged. So I voted yes because I was just being completely honest. Like yeah. this did restore my excitement and renew mm-hmm. my passion. Never fully mm-hmm. left, but I, you know. Matt was obviously was, yeah. a no. <laughs> yeah, I was a no. I'm not excited about Marvel. He's like, I need anything. an out on this podcast thing, and I just like don't know how to. I just don't know how to cut the cord. <laughs> I was a. Uh, I was on Ryan Doe's show across the Bifrost, and I was talking about how like one of my uh, guiding stars as a podcaster is like I don't really want to cover stuff I don't like because I think that generally if you're covering stuff you don't like, it's just not fun podcasting. Like right. I want all the podcasts I do. I'm there because I'm a fan. That doesn't mean I'm not going to like talk bad about a thing when a bad thing happens, but like I, I'm there because I may, I enjoy it. And like secret invasion had me really like, Oh, like it's hard to go into, it's hard to clock into podcasts today because I feel just like, I just don't like sitting for an hour and like crap talking a, a thing. And like, even I just felt terrible on, on the MCU cast, um, uh, Marvel cinematic universe podcast. If you don't know it, check it out. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it, it just kept like, you know, people were like, even like writing and defending it. Like, Hey, I really like this. And I just couldn't help myself. Be like, yeah, that's great. I'm so glad you liked that. But what you're not seeing <laughs> is, is it this. It's like, does it, is like, it? like, is it better? I don't know, man. I just, I had a really hard time. Like, just like letting people have say their piece without having to like crap on it. I don't want to yuck people's yums. You know, it's like, yeah, sure. it's, it's not it. I, I, I'm so, so mad about that show and it making me feel bad about what I do. And like, it was just like, <laughs> but be better be better <laughs> moving on dot com <laughs> <laughs> okay last thing we got here on the show is the lightning round we have a pretty substantial lightning round tonight so uh the rules are i'm gonna say a story everybody gets to chime in with their names uh and whoever says their name first gets to uh comment on that story and once per round you get to chime in with a rebuttal or response to that person's take uh so here we go happy death day and freaky director christopher landon has been tapped by spyglass to direct the upcoming horror film scream seven scotty yeah I love this news. I love the Happy De- Death Day films. They're some of my favorite horror comedies out there. Can't recommend them enough. Hope we get a third one. But Scream is also one of my favorite franchises, and it's going on its seventh film now. And it's one of those rare franchises, I would say, even its worst film, probably Scream 3, is still really enjoyable. So this is just a winning combination, and I'm super excited to see more of it. Hopefully get it. Well, we're not going to get a trailer anytime soon with uh, productions not happening, <laughs> but as soon as the strikes over, hopefully we, we start to see the groundwork being laid. The prosecution in the Jonathan majors domestic man. That's, that's just, I, I know it's, I know it's the lightning round. That's the point, but like, that was such a, that, that's a terrible segue. Cause there's no segue. That's the point, but it, sorry. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but just like going from like, love this horror franchise, the prosecution of Jonathan Majors. <laughs> just, it's just, it's just it's really hard to like, to, to jump back and forth between these like real life stories and the f- fun, you know. Okay, here we go. <laughs> up next, I should just put it up next and it feels better. Uh, okay. <laughs> up next, the prosecution of Jonathan Majors domestic violence case requested the trial date be pushed back. A new trial date has been set for September 6th. Haley, I start to get all like conspiracy theory about this. <laughs> like, well, why are they doing that? Like, is there a reason? Are they going to push it all the way back till after Loki comes out? Or <laughs> because I like to be tinfoil hat lady sometimes. Oh, it's the prosecution, right? So it's the people yeah. that are prosecuting him. Yeah, well, but yeah, who knows know. what snipers are looming in their doorway <laughs> <laughs> you're picturing like kevin feige around the corner like hey uh, we're gonna have to delay this hey, case we know they and have drones like, that are yes, like kevin. shooting things down <laughs> <laughs> yes kevin uh 
Um, okay. <laughs> Just do what Kevin says. He's powerful. Uh, okay. Up next, a second season of I Am Groot was announced this weekend. Five new short installments of the Marvel series will come to Disney Plus on September 6th. The same day as the Jonathan Major's domestic <laughs> violence. Oh, Sorry, gosh. I just thought that like bouncing back and forth in tones would be nice. Did not catch that until you just yes. pointed that out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say Matt on this one. Uh, I really liked the I Am Groot series. I thought it was really fun. Um, I think I, I think I threw everybody off by messing up the tones. Sorry, guys. Um, but I, I thought the I Am Groot series, like, it was not what I expected. I did not realize they were going to be three minutes each or whatever they were. Um, but if you sit down and then just enjoy the th- the entirety of the series being 15 minutes long or whatever, it's a nice little uh, thing. It feels like the cartoons they used to put on before a feature film, like they really sure. feel feel like that. I almost feel like they should just drop these at the beginning of every Marvel feature in theaters and it would be a lot of fun. Um, that'd be really fun for me. Uh, and seeing that, I think seeing them with an audience would actually be really great. But uh, for what they are, they're really, really high quality uh, fun animation with just good writing and good storytelling for the little bitty things that they are. Um, definitely for kids, though. Definitely a kids thing, but I like them. Up next, according to Forbes, Disney revealed that they spent $143 million on the budget for Loki Season 2, putting it above several MCU movies. But it also has a marginally smaller budget than their latest series, Secret Invasion, with its budget reportedly ballooning up to $212 million. <laughs> Jay, the, the 200 and tw- it's just like, that's so stupid. Like, $212 million for Secret Invasion is so stupid. Uh, and if you watch that final fight scene, like, that was not a $200, a $200 million fight scene. Like, they're somebody needs to check those books at marvel but um but yeah i mean i at least from the trailer like we've only seen the loki trailer but it did seem like the cgi looked crisp and clear from what i saw like Mm -hmm. the time the kind of the thing where he was like falling in and out of time the time Time warp or whatever they called it yeah time slipping it looked like it was well done i mean so maybe we're gonna start to see a little bit more of a better use of the dollars because watching secret invasion like there's no excuse for that movie having that high of a budget i know that there was high high talent in it i get that but that's an inexcusable amount of money to spend on a six episode series uh Mm. that turned out like it did in my opinion matt i I will agree it's a ridiculous amount of money i will say it's a great like acquisition of talent for the for the for that like so many great actors uh in 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 that series but also joining the MCU um and so i and if those cont- if they pick up those threads if they ever pick up any threads like um the the Sonya and um Gaia Gaia, thank you. The Sonya and Gaia storyline like I, i'm like oh where is that going like that sounds interesting i love both those actresses like maybe it was worth it to get some of the talent they did, but like, if you're gonna spend that much money, like, just run it by, run like the basic plot by more people. I just feel like, I feel like sometimes they in these series they'll like have great thought into some individual scenes, but they just don't put thought into the overall uh, aspects of the show. And it just it always makes me so angry when I hear the amount of money they spend on something, and then it just has like a blatant plot hole or like. A hole in the way that they characterize the things like there's so many there's we, we've talked about it ad nauseum on the marvel cinematic universe podcast where like just like so many little things that could have made the show better and it just it feels like they didn't think about it and it makes me so mad when there are creators out there every day like hoofing it trying to make the best content they can trying to think up through every little thing in in their universe and make it perfect and then these people with humongous budgets and they just don't think for a second <laughs> about like is everything <laughs> <laughs> sorry they don't think for a second about like how he has this big how freaking samuel jackson has this big speech in episode five which means nothing <laughs> like the whole resolution of the episode means absolutely nothing it like 
Sorry. You know, also no! too, I'm like, I'm like going completely off, off topic now at this point. We're not even talking about budgets, but like the writers aren't even talking to each other because they right. did, they interviewed the guy who directed it and they were like, Hey, when'd you all swap uh roadie for a scroll? And he didn't even know. Like he was like, uh, I mean, I guess it maybe was around this time. And I was like, how do you not know? That tells me that no one knows that they're just yeah. going to decide no. later. And they're like, maybe it'd be fun if you go back and watch Avengers and see if you can figure it out. It's like, no, no, you didn't pull Don Cheadle in a room and go, hey, man, you're going to be an alien in about six years. We're going to need you to act like a little bit different in this scene. Like, no, you didn't. You make it up as you go. Like, get out of here with that. So that's what's yep. annoying to me is yeah. that there is no grand plan. It's just, hey, we're, we're, you know this guy that's been in the movies? Like, make him an alien and then just – you don't even need to decide when it happens. Like, actually, don't decide when it happens. We're going right. to decide that later. <laughs> like, right. that's annoying. Totally. And my conspiracy theory about that <laughs> whole thing with Rhodey, and I guess spoiler alert for Secret Invasion, uh, the whole the whole thing with Rhodey being a scroll and like that yeah. whole thing, my, my conspiracy theory is they had a decision made and then they realized it made no sense. And they were like, uh, just don't answer it. Just we'll figure it out later. And then they just kicked <laughs> the can down the road. Because if they had said it was before, I, I have a feeling some script supervisor or something said, but wasn't Rhodey on Thanos' planet? And they went like, oh, crap. I don't think there were script supervisors. Yeah. I think that's part of the problem. You guys are reeling me in onto the bandwagon. I wanted to like bring it back to Loki and talk about the positives of Loki. But <laughs> oh, one yeah, thing Loki I gotta costs, get off. Uh, how much yeah. money again? Yeah, I have something to say about Loki. When well, done, but one thing I just, Scotty. I do want to get off my chest about Secret Invasion was, uh, spoilers for Secret Invasion, but the death of Talos, <laughs> like it was supposed to be this super heartfelt moment that Nick had to leave his body behind. And then the next episode, it's mm-hmm. like, oh, we got his body. We're doing a funeral for him. No big deal. <laughs> The uh, alien body was left in the middle of a Russian field, like, and we had no yeah. problem getting it back. It's just like, yeah, the, yeah, the, the lack of communication <laughs> between the writers was pretty evident to me. But yay, Loki season two, pour the money <laughs> into something that has, you know, the, proven itself. Talk about that lack of communication. It feels like a microcosm <laughs> of the like Star Wars thing with like the the pre, the sequel trilogy, where they bounce back and forth between creators. Yeah, sure. It yeah. feels like that. But like you, it's a six episode series, and the episodes are thirty minutes long. Yeah. You can't coordinate that to make sure the characters make sense. Sorry, Haley, you want to say something <laughs> positive about Loki? I do. I do. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's what I'm here for. Haley, why, why do you hate Secret Invasion? Um, go listen to my podcast. Source here. pages. We had a huge download spike when we released that episode, so Uh-oh. people must have really liked the hate fest that Brian and I had on our show. Um, I was going to say about Loki's budget, though. It's um, such a high production value show. They they put a lot into the world of the TVA and even just like the little gadgets that they have and all of that stuff. And in the trailer, when and I don't want to say his name wrong. Um, Kihu Kwan? Yes, thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, when he's like coming down in that weird looking little chair and he's got his messy desk. Like I think so much of the budget in Loki goes toward that. And it's mm. worth it because we yeah. feel immersed in this world. And so I'm glad to see. I think the first season, all I can find is it was like 25 million in episodes. So however many episodes there were, I, I think it's about on par with this this budget. Yeah. I feel like not enough has been said about Loki and how it is such a it's such a crazy fantastical story and like literally every episode they're jumping between realities and it's this high concept stuff that if you're not following it closely you're going to lose lose out and miss these big things and like people that aren't followers of other multiverse properties may get lost completely and like variants and they're they're like bringing in all this information and constant shifting and time travel and all this stuff I think the practical effects and the way they ground the TVA in that very practical and very analog. decided analog mm-hmm. aesthetic. Exactly. Yeah. I think that like grounds the show in a way that like it isn't spoken about enough. I just, I really mm-hmm. think yeah. that's super cool. Agreed. But speaking of secret invasion, okay. <laughs> I had to get it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cook, please. Let me tell you the thing. I I think the thing I hate the very most. <laughs> I love I love that this is right in the middle of the lightning it's ground. The end when... <laughs> we all needed this. 
people are listening to it and they're like, uh, this is supposed to be the lightning round, but like you don't understand that we love that this is in the middle of the lightning round. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We are all using our rebuttals here and it's fine. It's totally fine. <laughs> the thing I hate the most is when Sonia and Gaia go into the, the room full of bodies at the end and she's like, this is how the enemy got so good. And I was like, what the f- does that mean what are you talking about who are you talking about which enemy who are these people why are you guys in this warehouse where is this warehouse and who even are you and i hated it i hated it and you can bleep me out on that one this goes deeper than we've ever thought and it's like but how deep like what are you talking about who's in charge like who are all these people are there are there thousands and thousands of more scroll splinter cells all over the planet like yeah. It's like they wanted to have like five like Ocean's Eleven moments where they're like, <laughs> oh yeah, what you thought isn't true. It's this is that is true. And it makes you go like, whoa. But like they didn't earn a single one. And everybody right. was just left shaking their heads just being like, that was not smart at all. But like it took itself so much more seriously. Uh, but the writing, when you think about it for more than five seconds, it like doesn't make sense. No. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all right, well... Uh, We're starting this lightning round over now. <laughs> <laughs> I declare. <laughs> no, continuing the lightning round. We got a few more stories. No one has rebuttals left. Anyone else that uses rebuttals, they're, they're, a, a, ro- they're a rogue agent. Right, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> we'll see. Up next, Netflix has released a first look at Spy Kids Armageddon, the reboot of the Spy Kids franchise from Robert Rodriguez. The film, which stars Zachary Levi and Gina Rodriguez, is set to debut on September 22nd. Uh, Jay, I think it's interesting uh, to see when you're when I was reading these quotes from Robert Rodriguez talking about <laughs> making this movie, and he's made a lot of movies in his lifetime, and uh, he was like, what they they asked him like what's uh, the movie that you get asked about the most and he was like well actually the spy kids fan base is rabid and they ask me all the time like when are you going to reboot spy kids and that was surprising to me because i didn't know that spy kids which uh the one from the uh i have no idea when that movie was made probably the early 2000s but it had yeah. antonio banderas and uh, i forget uh, antonio banderas getting a second shout out on the podcast tonight uh but um but i forget who else was in <laughs> That, He's but, our new patron. Uh, <laughs> 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 hey, hey, don't you dare! Uh, but uh, but um, the uh, was it Carla Cugino? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, but Love I her. thought that I found that interesting. Uh, that the idea was that there was apparently like a demand for this. Like people loved that Spy Kids movie, uh, which I just didn't. That was under my radar. I didn't realize that it was such a popular franchise. But um, apparently, people are very excited about a reboot of this franchise. Awesome! Awesome. Up next, uh, rumor has it uh, the planned Hunchback of Notre Dame live action remake has been scrapped by Disney. Matt, <laughs> good. Yeah. Next up, visual <laughs> effects crews at Marvel Studios have voted to unionize as announced by International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. Matt, this is great. Unionize, please. Um, get, let Marvel start uh, giving you time, if nothing else. <laughs> like uh, <laughs> this, this whole uh, a lot of things that Marvel has been uh, going downhill with their effects, and I think it's due to their uh, overuse of the labor that they're hiring, and it's not getting well, they're not getting good work because they're not treating their people well. So I think this is good for the movies, although. Unionization can lead to stoppages and strikes, which could delay Marvel even more. And it's weird that this is just Marvel Studios VFX hmm. crews that are doing this and not, you know, across the entire industry. Hopefully it will right. lead to across the entire industry. But this, uh, this is interesting. Viva la revolution. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Power That's to the right. people. Power to the people. <laughs> Up next. According to Deadline, in the wake of Mattel's success with Barbie, Crayola <laughs> launched its own studio to develop a range of children's TV shows and movies. Hasbro is reported to have plans for a Monopoly and a Play-Doh film. Or films. A Play-Doh Haley. cinematic universe. <laughs> yes, Haley. <laughs> okay, I, and I see the Crayola stuff is like, people in big crayon costumes <laughs> like walking around like some sort of 
awful, but it's for children, so it'll probably be okay. Um, a Monopoly movie sounds kind of fun, sort of in the vein of the Loki aesthetic that we were just talking about. I could see that being kind of mm. a crazy, cute little thing. But yeah. Okay. So Hollywood's just really out of ideas. And they're like, you know what's cool? <laughs> they did this in 1994, I think. Toys! <laughs> Mm. I, uh, I'm very curious as to the plot of a Play-Doh film. Like, what are we doing here? Like, uh, is this going to be like a Flubber reboot or something? Like, what's the what's the Flubber. plan? <laughs> they did it with Lego. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, like, they did it with wrong. Lego and they yeah. pulled it off. Yeah. <laughs> I just I find myself wondering like how many of these like you know product based movies are going to skew towards something like the Tetris movie or like the McDonald's movie, The Founder, where it's like about yeah. the. Mm-hmm the story behind the product or if we're going to get more like the Lego movie or like Barbie where it's like celebrating the, you know, the world that you live in when you're playing with these, these products. And uh, we know we had a lot of fun with the magic eight ball last week. I, I love the psychological <laughs> thriller we, angle we went down to, we went down, but uh, when I think of monopoly, I immediately think of like, okay, so they're going to make like more of an accessible, like the big short. Is that what we're going mm. for here? Yeah. <laughs> or like a live action The Jungle by Upton Sinclair, you know? Kind of like <laughs> yeah, oh gritty, gritty, <laughs> gritty city streets, like, you know, big business dominating child labor, you yeah. know, all that, and fighting Tenet Tenet all. It's dark. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. I, 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 for some reason, I see the Monopoly movie, like, set and, like, in that, like, Hudsucker proxy kind of, like, style. I don't know. I don't know why. Um <laughs> But like that that era and like business and like just I imagine like different people on different sides of the street trying to rule the city or like trying to make all the money. Like yeah, I, I could see it. I could see it. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um I'm gonna respond to this. I know we've all four already responded to it. Uh the and only <laughs> only Haley had the right to. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> but uh but we uh <laughs> the, this is just Hollywood taking the wrong lessons like they always do for the last 15 years. It's been, everybody wants a cinematic universe. And if the, if nothing else, maybe this will get people off of that. You know, I love a cinematic universe. I really do, but you only need it in certain circumstances and you only need it when it's called for and when it's begged for and when it, the, the, the source material creates it, you do not need a cinematic universe for everything. And that has watered down the whole idea of it. And that has hurt, uh, you know, the ones that are doing well, Marvel did a great thing with creating their cinematic universe, but like now it's just, it's just saturated. The the market is saturated with cinematic universes and maybe at least like Hollywood's got something else to rush off onto. And maybe, uh, maybe, maybe Marvel can probably be left alone to do their thing. I feel like there's been a a few instances where you've made similar points on this show. And I've, I've often been reminded of this quote, but it's now just really sticking with me. But in the movie Incredibles, the villain, voiced by Jason Lee syndrome. He yeah. has this line, when everybody com- becomes special, nobody is. Mm, exactly. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and they're kind of abusing the verse term. Like Marvel Cinematic Universe is a continuous universe, but like the Mattel verse of the Barbie you know, thing, how are we going to have all of those things? All of those, is Barbie going to be attacked by an evil magic eight ball in, you know, the 2028 <laughs> horror flick of the spooky season? Like, no. So it's not really, people are using it kind of in the way you call all tissues Kleenex. It's like, that's mm. not really what it, it, you know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Back off. Yeah, yeah. Back off. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Director William Friedkin, best known for his Oscar-winning The French Connection and blockbuster The Exorcist, died Monday in Los Angeles. He was 87. Scotty. Yeah, I feel like William Friedkin is, uh, as as far as like cinephiles go, he's a household name, but he really, he's this legacy director that really changed the game and he changed it not once, but twice and maybe even more than that, like looking at The French Connection, like it change the way we approach action and do chase sequences. And then he went and did it again with the exorcist. Like, has there been any other horror movie that has persisted in the pop culture the same way? So, um, definitely sad to see him pass. Um, you know, 87 is a fairly ripe old age. So condolences to his friends, his family and his fans. And, uh, you know, I do think this just kind of harkens, I think, um, for those of us that are fans of like old school filmmakers like this from the seventies, 
we're going to start to lose more and more of these filmmakers that contributed so heavily to the landscape. So I think we need to really appreciate them while they're here. And if you're not familiar with William Friedkin's work, go back and, and check it out because, you know, uh, highly influential. I think you will see his influence in, uh, across and in maybe some of your favorite movies. Absolutely. The Incredible Hulk director, uh, Luis Leterrier, uh, revealed that there were plans for a potential sequel that included Grey Hulk and Red Hulks. Haley, <laughs> um, I just watched this movie the fir- for the first time last weekend. Wow! <laughs> and really, it yeah, and I was like, oh, this really isn't that bad. Like, it's a very typical early aughts movie with you know this pacing that it doesn't really need and lots of plot holes, but you can kind of gloss over it and. Um, so we were going to have like a Hulk verse before the MCU, I guess, became a real thing. And that kind of would have been fun, but you also probably don't have the audience at that time for a bunch of Hulk movies. <laughs> mm. The long time DC storyboard artist, Jay Oliva, described Ben Affleck's scrapped Batman flick as, quote, effing awesome and was building off of storylines in the Batman mythos over the last 80 years. Matt, (laughs) I cannot believe they made it through the DCEU and didn't make a Batman movie. I've said it before, but I'm still just incensed that this movie never happened. Like how much we would have cared if they'd like actually given us time with Ben Affleck's Batman. And it sucks. It just sucks. I, I like, I'm very critical of the DCEU, but like it has so many elements going for it and it just fumbles the ball constantly and just doesn't get movies together. Like they never got a Superman, like really two that was just a Superman movie and they never made a Batman movie and they just, it's, it's like the entire thing is like what people are complaining about with phase four of Marvel where there's so many threads starting and nothing ever follows up and it's just, you know. They just shouldn't have made it, tried to make a cinematic universe if they couldn't handle keeping the balls in the air of the other, the individual plot lines and the individual movies continuing on. They they make like one movie every two years, it feels like, and they just don't connect and they just, it just takes them too long to make their cinematic universe. They don't have a good planning stage and it just makes me mad to hear how good this Batman flick is supposed to be according to this uh, storyboard <laughs> artist because it just never happened. Who would Matt Damon have played? Good question. Mm, That is good. (laughs) I'm going to go into overdraft with my rebuttals here because uh, I do take this one with a grain of salt because apparently this was like a second draft uh, that Jay Oliva got to got to take a look at. And yeah, it makes sense when you're that far along and the, the script isn't really refined. Of course, it's going to include all these these effing awesome elements and pull from the entire history of Batman and have all these touchstones. But I do wonder, you know, if the film had gotten further along in production, how much of that really would have stayed. And, I, I, you know, I have a lot of confidence in Ben Affleck, not only as a performer, but as a filmmaker. You look at something like Gone Girl, like he has the chops and, and can do it. So I do agree with you that it's a shame that we never got to see this, but it's like, you know, it's easy to say something that got scrapped is like, you know, incredible and awesome, but ultimately it got scrapped. Yeah. Yep. yep. David Ayer uh, says James Gunn told him the Suicide Squad Ayer cut would have its time to be shared. <laughs> Jay, I can't. <laughs> I, I like, it, I, I just, I love that Jay's <laughs> chiming in with his laughs every time. I know. Now. Like, <laughs> I, I just find all these stories so funny. And like, this is the, <laughs> this is the funniest to me. Like, I can't believe that this is still a conversation. Like, this is the second major conversation around a DC movie from a universe that isn't really a thing anymore about seeing a cut of a movie that was put out there. And the Snyder Cut happened, and it was what it was, and it was put onto HBO Max, and people watched all four hours of it or whatever. But, like, the idea that this is just going to be a normalized conversation around movies that we don't like (laughs) is just so bizarre to me. Like, well, we didn't like it, but the reason we didn't like it is because the studio, it's the studio's fault and the studio's the bad guy. They crushed it. And so we have to see the extended version all stitched together or whatever. Like Warner brothers has got to just be like, how do we stop 
these conversations from happening around these movies that <laughs> flopped at the box office that people weren't super into that we couldn't continue a universe around. But you've got these like super loud online communities that really want to see the uncut version. So do we like do what we did with the Snyder Cut and throw millions of dollars at it to re-stitch it together to put it up and for what like what was the point of putting the Snyder Cut back up on HBO Max like do you think it bumped subscribers any more than it already was I mean like so it's just it's such a weird and I'm not even necessarily crapping on it it's just it's just an interesting thing that like you have these conversations popping up around the Snyder Cut and then completely around the air cut and initially it was seemed like it was almost kind of like a joke but now it's taken on a much more serious tone that you have Mm you know, James Gunn and David Ayer and these people coming out and talking about it as being a serious thing. Uh, so I, I do wonder what the future of that looks like. Uh, if, uh, when we see movies that we don't necessarily feel like, like we talked to, we just spent like 20 minutes talking about secret invasion. Like, you know, you could, you see a conversation and like release the cut that didn't get put out where actually it was way better. And there's a seventh episode that ties it all back together. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like these are conversations we can't have because they're just, they're not what's put out there. And it just, it's so messy and, and weird. <laughs> was it not air? Was he not the director of the final cut? They read, they had a, trailer company come in and re-edit his film so he had a a cut of the film that was very like self-serious apparently and very like uh, a a lot more serious of a movie and then they literally hired multiple trailer companies from what i remember they to come in and recut the film Mm -hmm. and one and they chose one of the cuts from the trailer companies to come in and basically they just put a bunch of needle drop music in it and made the whole thing the whole tone lighter and more fun um did they though did they? <laughs> no, no. Did no. you, it, it did did you have fun? Off. Did you have fun watching that movie? I didn't. Nope, definitely not. Definitely yeah. not. Uh, I I do have to chime in on the timing of this headline because it feels like you know right after Gal Gadot came forward and said like, "Hey, I had this conversation with James Gunn," and he said, this, yeah. David Eric was like, "Well, that happened for me too. Let me make a headline here too." About. And it's like yeah. we're only getting Get that threads, one. James. <laughs> we only have that one part of the quote where James apparently said. It, there would be a time for it to be shared. And I just have to imagine, like, I hear that in a very placating tone. Like, there's a time for it to be shared, and that time is not now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometime, but not yeah, now. Yeah, 20 years from now, we'll put out the air cut. I, I, it's, this is all reminding me, it's making me feel like, and no offense to James Gunn, I love him, such a great creator, but I feel like he's kind of like the Elon Musk of, of these superhero movies on Twitter. I this from the beginning. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was like, I don't know if James Gunn has like the. He's such a creative person, and to be in this kind of leadership role, you have to sideline some of that. And I don't know that he can do that. Mm. Right. Well, I, I just mean like he can't shut up. Like he's he's hurting <laughs> he's That's hurting his brand <laughs> by like talking too much to other people on Twitter. He's answering too many questions. Like let the art stand for itself. Make good art. Put it out. And he's always been that way with the Guardians movies too. But like it's kind of fun when he's like talking about Easter eggs and stuff. It's different when you're talking about a movie a, a see like a big cinematic franchise that doesn't exist yet and you're answering questions and like changing your mind and like make the decisions stick with them let us find out things as they come out. I I feel like he's like, he's a big Twitter guy and he just can't keep his mouth shut. And it's hurting the whole brand and the, the rollout process of this entire thing. I believe you you mean X uh, by the way. It's uh, it's called, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Sorry. They hired two of them and it's like, well, cause guns, the creative side and Saffron's the whatever business side. And, but Gun's not being reined in. Like yeah. he mm-hmm. should be. There should be more of a plan. I mean, and I'm not saying that like he's doing these are bad things, but they're hurting an already hurting franchise. I think, and you know, he's it's just like there's no training or he doesn't care. Um, yeah. I don't know. Well, and I, I I get it. I think he's an artist and he wants to be like connected yeah. to the fans, and he just doesn't want that layer of inauthenticity around it. But like, you need the you need the calculated decided ro- rollout of information yeah. sure. when you're coming out with these because that's part of the product part of the product is the hype before the movie and and it's just it's unavoidable and it's, it's what it's what marketing has always been but nowadays with these cinematic universes 
You're always rolling out the next thing during the other things. And the way you piecemeal information is incredibly important because it spins off a thousand YouTube videos about what you just said. Yeah. Um, you need somebody yeah. like pulling him back from the sideline, like the, the chargers head coach or whatever. <laughs> is that the chargers? Uh, the Rams. Jay? <laughs> the Rams. Rams. <laughs> LA team. Sports. <laughs> Both LA. Yeah. Easy, easy crossover there. Last story we got here uh, is A24 has greenlit a sequel to Talk to Me with directors Danny and Michael Filippo set to return. Matt. Oh, what? <laughs> I'm just kidding. What? J. Scotty, take it. I was just I was joking. I don't even know this movie. It's, it's just, you got just, me. You got I was just me. trolling yeah. J. Scotty. <laughs> you, you, you did. You got it's me like good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, your resident A24 fanboy is here. Um, I really enjoy Talk to Me. I love A24 because it's like a film filmmaker first production company. Um, so Talk to Me, I think like, you know, A24 Horror tends to have this um, reputation for being a little inaccessible and like elevated art house horror. I will say I think Talk to Me is like their most conventional and straightforward and accessible horror movie they've done. So uh, the numbers it's pulled at the box office Plus, taking that into account, I think it makes a lot of sense for them to to create a sequel. And um, I think this is like one of like two or three sequels they've ever done. The only other sequels that come to mind are Ty West's X franchise with Mia Goth. So mm. um, as, you know, A24 builds up steam and becomes more popular. I mean, they, they pulled in so many Oscars last year, not for any horror movies, but they still, you know, they, they have that reputation. And as a fan, uh, I love to see it. Mm hmm. My favorite movie. It's an A24 movie. Everything you ever all at once, baby. Whew. Yeah. Oh, good. All right. All right. That wraps our lightning round up. And uh, let's, uh, let's talk about where we p- can find you guys online. Uh, Jay Scotty, where can people find you online? Yeah, you can check me out at Animation Deliberation, where the podcast that takes action, animation, and cartoons seriously, but not too seriously. And there's so much animated content right now. I encourage mm. you to check it out, whether it's anime, whether it's my adventures with Superman, whether it's Harley Quinn season four, there's something for everybody. So uh, wherever you get your podcast, check out Animation Deliberation, and yeah. there will be no secret invasion hate on that podcast. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't, don't threaten me with a good time. <laughs> Jay's like, bring me on, Scotty. <laughs> I, I will ruin that promise. Uh, <laughs> Haley Hobbs, tell people where they can find you online. You can find me at Source Pages, a reading collective, anywhere you listen to podcasts. Just recorded our 100th episode last night with a few of our awesome friends and looking forward to trucking on, reading, even if there's stuff not to watch. <laughs> Awesome. And Jay Sisson. Uh, you can find me at Commute the Podcast, where we make a weekly sh- uh, educational show perfect for your commute to work. It lasts about 20 minutes. We cover three interesting things and try to give you some uh, cool things that you didn't know to talk about at work or wherever you're going. Sweet. And you can find me uh, all over the Strain of Panda Network, strainofpanda.com. Check out any of the shows. They're all, all very wonderful. Um, and we'll be back with more multiverse news next week uh, and more of these crazy headlines. Peace. You stay classy, multiverse. <laughs>